afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to many of you. For those of you joining us for the first time, I'm Maggie Mahan, the Assistant Director for Community Engagement with the State Historical Society of Missouri. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Afternoon, as the Associate Director of the Cape Girardeau Research Center, Bill Edelman presents the 10th installment in his Beginning Genealogy Workshop series. Today's program will focus on hidden treasures, tips and rewards for researching in manuscript collections. If you need to catch up on previous installments of the series or would like to rewatch any of the segments, you can view them on demand on the SHSMO website at SHSMO. Dot O-R-G. All events in our virtual programming series are made possible thanks to the generous support of the society's members and donors. Visit our website to learn more and see how you can add or renew your support. Thank you again for joining us. And now I will turn things over to Bill. Welcome, Bill. Thanks, Maggie. Imagine if you were to run across in your genealogical research, uh, something like this. It's a letter and it states in part, we are still getting a lot of green recruits and it seems that each crop is greener. A lot of our non-coms are out training the Philippine army. That leaves quite a bit of work for the rest of us. The oriental situation is still uncertain. Well, I hope it stays quiet for six more months as I will be leaving here then. All men are going back now after two years, so I should be leaving in May. I like this place all right, but I would like to be back home again. And it's dated November 22nd, 1941. Many of you will notice that date and think two weeks later, something happened in the Pacific and that was Pearl Harbor. This was a letter that my uncle wrote to my grandmother uh, on November 22nd. It is also the last communication that we ever got, the family ever got from my uncle Bill. He was a participant in the Battle of Bataan. He was uh, taken prisoner, <clears throat> survived the death march, ended up in Cabanatuan POW camp where he died of disease in August 1942. This is a letter that is among many materials I've donated to a manuscript collection that is in uh, State Historical Society of Missouri in Cape Girardeau. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is similar collections and what you can get out of these collections uh, as family historians. So first of all, I'm gonna talk about manuscript collections. Well, what is a manuscript? <clears throat> Those of you that know the Latin will notice manus or hand uh, as part of the word. And it is defined at least in evidence explained by the genealogist Elizabeth Schoen Mills as a piece of writing in its native unpublished state, derived from the Latin meaning written by hand, the term is also applied in modern times to unpublished typescripts. Nowadays, I think we might also expand that to recordings, sound recordings and digital material. More and more, we're getting at least partially collections that are digital. <clears throat> Where do these things come from? Well, they come from individuals. I donated those materials. I ended up with all the family letters during World War II, and my cousins agreed that it would be a good idea uh, that I donate those because they'd be accessible to them as well as to others who might be interested. So they come from a lot of individuals. They come from estates. People's relatives die. We've gotten a number of really good collections because a relative dies who has no children and their nieces, nephews, or other relations, cousins decide that maybe it would be a good idea <clears throat> to make their materials available and they don't want them. Businesses are another source, groups and organizations. And finally, a very rare event because of limited resources, but occasionally in archives will purchase some materials if they're very, very uh, of a lot of interest. Give you an idea of some of the uh, things that are in manuscript collections. First of all, there's personal records. This is a diary that was kept by Henry Ellison Skaggs, who uh, was a Civil War soldier and survived the war, lived till 1895. <clears throat> 
one of his descendants or relatives apparently donated this diary to the State Historical Society and it resides in Rolla. And you can see it's kind of a minimal piece of information. He records the weather, but then he also records their movements and why they moved in some cases and what they were doing. And so if you match this up with other records, you get a really nice, complete uh, outline of what his unit was during, doing during the Civil War. You also may get slave records. And this is actually an emphasis area that State Historical Society has right now. We are uh, getting all slave bills of sales scanned and they will be available in our digital collections. But this is one where it's, uh, it's basically a plantation uh, uh, record and just what happened on the farm. And the thing that struck me when I looked at this one, and this is in, from the Thomas W. Conyers collection papers. And what struck me is the livestock was named as well as the slaves. So the slaves were just considered as more livestock, which is pretty reprehensible. So enslaved people in, appear in these collections as well. Sometimes we get old plat maps and what value are old plat maps? They show exactly where your ancestor might've owned land, especially if these plat maps have an index, but I've blown part of this one from Adair County up and you can see there's uh, some, the roads are shown, the streams are shown, but also land ownership. And the neat thing about plat maps to me is you can, at a glance, you can tell who the neighbors were. And oftentimes if you're stuck on your ancestor, you need to research the neighbors and try to find records where your ancestor might be mentioned. <clears throat> there's all sorts of maps and uh, to a certain extent, I use some of these old maps as an example of how just because it's an old map doesn't mean it's an accurate map. This is a map of, of Missouri from about the time period, I'd say 18, 19, or 20. And it shows uh, Wayne County actually larger than it probably was because the lower part of Wayne County actually during this time period was a, an extinct county in Missouri called Lawrence County. The Lawrence County we have today is a different county that was, that was uh, raised later. But this Lawrence County actually was the Southern part of Missouri and then kind of evolved into Lawrence County, Arkansas over time. So you get an idea of uh, county boundary changes, but there's more accurate ways to do that in many instances. Also organizational records. This is the Fruitland Grange, which the Grange was an agricultural organization that had chapters all over the country, particularly strong in the Midwest. And Fruitland is a community that uh, unincorporated north of Cape Girardeau and kind of northeast of Jackson. And a lot of names mentioned in here, a lot of what the Grange was doing. And uh, this was donated by uh, the descendant of one of the members of the Grange who ended up with the organizational records. So uh, we get an idea of the Grange and how it participated in a part of county history in this case. Really neat are old photographs. We have a lot of old photographs in, in our collections and many other manuscript collections contain them. The nice thing is a lot of times there are that have writing on the front, a sign. And you can look at this and figure out what a downtown area might have looked like during a certain time. You can also look at the business names and maybe, maybe figure out if the name of the town's not on here, what town it actually was. So uh, we get an idea of the past and what it looked like from manuscript collections. More and more oral histories are coming into manuscript collections. Oral histories, uh, I wish we had them from early days, but of course, recording didn't really come about until the and come into its own until the 20th century. But more and more, we're getting older people in to talk about their lives and record oral histories. So if you ever find any of these, you'd be incredibly lucky, but it's really valuable if you do. 
In some cases, we have separate newspaper collections and many uh, archives, but sometimes you'll get stray issues of newspapers in manuscript collections. And we've talked about newspapers before and we know how valuable those can be. So what are you going to find as a family historian in manuscript collections now that we've seen some of the sorts of things that are in manuscript collections? Well, sometimes there are public records not retained by local governments. Our own uh, state archives in Missouri is very strong in this area. A lot of uh, public records, this, the local county repositories may have run out of room. They may not want to retain the, the records and so they send them to the state archives. In some cases, these are microfilm. The originals are still in place, but the microfilm's available at the, uh, in the manuscript collection. You might get insight into your ancestor and what they were doing and the sort of things they were doing and where they were and uh, what sort of person they were, if it's a really good source. You may have additional sources providing indirect evidence for relationships. The, the illustration is a Bible record that's part of a collection in uh, the Settle family papers in Cape Girardeau. And this just happened to be the, the uh, Donor was uh, a maternal, well, it was the, the guy that had the collection of materials. It was his wife's relative that ended up with these materials. So they meant nothing to them, so they donated them. But the uh, fellow who collected the information, his mother was a Rhodes uh, back a couple generations, and then she was an O'Bannon. And so uh, we ended up with a Bible page out of it. You may get vital records in areas where they were not recorded. And the nice thing about this Bible record here is it's from Wayne County, which had a catastrophic county courthouse fire in 1893. You might get a, an idea of how your ancestor participated in historic events. They may have noticed this in a diary or it may be noted in somebody else's diary that your ancestor participated in something or was doing something. We got photographs oftentimes where I've run into photographs of ancestors or collateral ancestors that I never knew existed in manuscript collections. They also are a bridge for information gaps in burn counties. This again is from the same collection. Turns out the Virgil Settle that, that, that had this collection and died without any descendants, his grandfather was the county recorder for Wayne County and ended up keeping almost 30 unrecorded D or unclaimed original deeds. Because of the courthouse fire, some of these don't exist in any other form other than this original that was in the Settle family papers. Life events and historical background. And I want to talk just a minute about what this one is. It's from the Samuel Montgomery papers. Montgomery was an officer for the Union during the Civil War, and he was stationed in Bloomfield. His wife had died. He met a younger woman, fell in love. They were married. She was a very staunch Southern sympathizer. And as a result, Montgomery's men actually brought him up, uh, managed to get him court-martialed, was acquitted, uh, because he had married this traitorous rebel woman. And she actually, uh, the doctor for the, the, the Confederates when they attacked Cape Girardeau, left a sword and other materials with her uh, at one point. And then in this letter, he was asking for these items back. So. Uh, if you're interested in the Montgomery's, this is of interest, but if you're interested in the Edwards family, this was John Edwards, I believe, and this may be of interest to you too. Newspapers that are found in no other collections nor in digital format may be in archival or manuscript collections. Now there's different types of manuscript collections depending on several factors. One of the important things I'll talk about is a finding aid. This really allows you to determine at a distance what's in a manuscript collection. Sometimes there's no finding aid. 
Sometimes there's such a complete finding aid that you have an every name index to the collection. These, the ones that have no finding aids tend to be local historical societies, local groups, local libraries. They just don't have the resources to do finding aids. The ones that have really good finding aids tend to be at the higher level, university, state, or national archives. Local archives tend to be small. As you move upward for finding aids being more complete, you tend to find that in the larger archives. The sort of personnel you have at these small local archives are volunteer or non-professional staff. And then of course, in the larger ones that have really good finding aids, you have professionals, professional archivists, you have pre-professional staff, translate that as usually graduate students or undergraduate volunteers or paid undergraduates who help out. And something like our organization, the State Historical Society of Missouri, we have very good finding aids, particularly the, the newer ones, and we're actually upgrading finding aids all the time. So I, I mentioned a finding aid. What is in a really good finding aid. First of all, the collection is given a number and a name. So I'm gonna run through the Lorena Shell Acre genealogical papers, which is, the number is CG0024. CG stands for Cape Girardeau. If it's a Columbia collection, it's C. If it's a Raleigh collection, it's R and so forth. And then the number is just a serial number from our first collection to, I think our current one is up to around 51. Then the collection title, the dates covered, very important if you're doing research on a family and the dates covered uh, by this collection don't correspond to when your ancestor was in the area, it's probably not going to be worth a further look. Who created it? That is who owned the collection before it was donated? An abstract of what's in it, the size, and usually that's either in cubic feet or folders or both. Um, small ones, usually not very many cubic feet. It's just described as so many folders. Or, and then we get them on up to hundreds of cubic feet. The language they're in, most of ours are in English, of course. We have a few in French, a few in Spanish. Where it's uh, deposited. Any restrictions on access, sometimes the donor retains copyright. So you might have, sometimes there's privacy issues with newer materials and we may restrict them for research. So you have to look at this before you request something. Um, access and copyright restrictions. Then uh, preferred citation which is usually the item, the box number, the folder number and so forth, and the other material from above. And then who donated it and when? And in this case, these were materials Lorena Aker had given to me some years ago, and I was the actual donor, even though she uh, gave them to me. Then a little bit on how the, it's arranged. And there, if there are subunits in larger collections, they'll be divided into series. Then the scope, that is the breadth of information, details on contents. A container listing, usually done folders. It may be done by boxes if it's a large collection, and then folders. And then an index to names, locations, or other information. Now, Keep in mind, many, as I mentioned, many of the local uh, manuscript collections do not have finding aids. So you just have to contact the holder of the collection and ask what's in it. So where are you gonna find manuscript collections? How do you locate them? Well, you have your own manuscript collection if you're a family historian. And a lot of times it ends up looking like the picture. Um, you can get these from relatives or your own family documents. That's your manuscript collection. And I would encourage people to index these things, even if it's just tabs on the folders. Or if you put, if you do everything on the computer, uh, directories and subdirectories. 
types of organizations that maintain them. That's what you're going to, is going to be a guide for what to look for. So first of all, I'm, I'm going to go down the line with different types of organizations. We have state historical societies like the State Historical Society of Missouri. Now be aware that there are many states, Virginia is one example, there is no Virginia State Archives. It's called the Virginia State Library, the State Library of Virginia. And that is true of many states. It's called the State Library when it really functions not only as a library, but also as an archives. Some counties have archives and also some counties have historical societies or both. This is Cape Girardeau County Archive Center. Uh, Cape Girardeau County is a relatively large county that's uh, economically pretty well off. And so some years ago, they built an archive center, mainly because they were bulging at the seams in the courthouse and the county office building. And so older materials have gone into the archive center. You're not going to learn this unless you look at a place like the Family Search Wiki or uh, search online or uh, look at uh, uh, Roots Web sites or other locations to try to find what the local situation is. Some local historical societies in towns have a separate archives. The Cape River Heritage Museum in Cape Girardeau County does have some archival materials and it's in Cape Girardeau. The county seat is Jackson. Some libraries that function as libraries and not as libraries and archival uh, collections still have manuscript collections. And this one is, uh, I believe the St. Louis, no, that's a New York Public Library. And you also have the Library of Congress, which has very large manuscript uh, collection. And uh, you just need to look on their website and see if you can find a catalog or something else to indicate what's in there. Most universities have something called special collections and archives. Some of these are only specific to university archives. So that's it. You're gonna learn a lot about the university and its past, but very little about anything else. Some also collect materials from their region. This is Kent Library at Southeast Missouri State, also in Cape Girardeau. They have a lot of materials on the region as well as all the materials for the history of the university. So I go here frequently uh, because of certain collections they have. There are also um, archives at the National, the National Archives. The one on the right is uh, Archives 2 in College Park, Maryland. State Archives, that's in the left, lower left, that's the Missouri State Archives. Counties, local entities, organizations maintain archives. So if it's, if it's a fraternal organization that's been around a long time or a religious organization or a business, they may have their own archives. You just need to look. How do you locate them? First of all, no matter what, I generally use a web search. We've talked about searching the web before and using uh, Boolean logic to search for websites and search for information. And the same thing holds for manuscript collections. I have found probably as much by doing this in manuscript collections as I have found in some of the more mainline archival search mechanisms. So don't ignore this. It's probably, I was searching for one of the old Civil War forts that was in Cape Girardeau and actually came up with some materials that were in different state archival collections that didn't pop up in archive grid, which I'll talk about in a minute. So try different things. If you're looking for something and looking for an archival collection, you never know what's going to give you a hit. Some manuscript collections, um, you can find them by looking in family search. And you're going to go through United States genealogy and the different states 
uh, to find those. So that's one place to look and see where there are manuscript collections. Some are mentioned in the Na National Genealogical Society research in the States series. So uh, that's a good place to start. You're not gonna find too many in most of these, but you never know what you're gonna find until you look. So here's a strategy for finding ancestors in a manuscript collection. First of all, I do what's called a reasonably exhaustive research. We've talked about all these different places to look and how to use them in earlier sessions. Go through all those, find everything you can about your ancestor before you go to manuscript collections, because you're going to have more of a chance of filling out their life or filling out the skeleton of their life by doing the traditional sources. Then use online search resources. Once you find a potential, um, see if there are finding aids or go into a deeper search on that website if you find a website. If you're still not finding anything, repeat that for the friends, associates, and neighbor, your ancestor, the people that lived around them, that travel with them, that appear a lot in records with them. Then access or contact the archive. And this is a real mixed bag. Not all of them even have email. Um, you may have to call them. It just depends. Keep in mind, a lot of the little local ones are only open certain days of the week. And you may have to get that information either from a Facebook page or somewhere else and or call the local library as I'll talk in number 10 here and figure out when they're there. Then you can get a copy. Many of the larger archives particularly will copy things for you for a small fee. Some of them will loan. I know if you find something in the Columbia uh, Research Center for our organization, they can get it, and you live in Cape Girardeau, they can get it down here, uh, give them some time, and you can use it locally. Or hire a local researcher to do the research on site. This, a lot of people get turned off by this when they, they look at prices. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to pay that for somebody. Well, consider that you could flounder around for years and the information you needed may have been in that collection. Um, also consider that if you're going to have to travel to the site and do the research yourself, you have travel expenses, you have lodging expenses, you have food expenses. It may end up cheaper, being cheaper going with a local researcher. Smaller archives, you can search online by using location and archive. Try different combinations of name and location. Sometimes you'll get a hit if you do Smith County archives. You'll get different hits than if you do archives, Smith County. And don't ask me why that's so, but it's so. Uh, it just depends. It's a quirk of the search engines. Contact local societies. Uh, join a local society, as I've said before. A lot of these local societies are dying on the vine right now from lack of members. And uh, you need to join and keep them going because they're the ones that know their area. Uh, a lot of times you don't, and you're not going to learn about that area thoroughly the way they have for years. Finally, if all else fails, contact the main library branch in the county of interest. There, they might know something. Librarians know things. And that's, that's the ultimate thing I use is, hey, is there a local historical society? Do you know if they have uh, manuscript collections? So I'm gonna talk briefly about some online search resources. And the example I'm going to run through this is one of my ancestors, actually probably two of my ancestors had the same name, uh, Reverend Aaron Pinson. And the problem here is Aaron Pinson 
was a great guy apparently because so many of his descendants named kids after him. And then there were also very strong Baptists. And so many of them became ministers. So Rev there are Reverend Aaron Pinson's all over the South from the mid 1700s on. So uh, it's, it's not easy sorting them out. The one I'm interested in is born in possibly uh, Virginia, possibly Orange County, North Carolina in the 1750s. He lived in Washington County, North Carolina, which is actually Tennessee today, then in Wilkes County, North Carolina in the 1780s. Then Spartanburg County, South Carolina, actually briefly before Washington County, North Carolina, and later came back in the 1790s until 1807. Then he was in Warren County, Kentucky till 1821 and possibly made to Missouri in his old age with a son. I don't know for sure yet. So I'm gonna search for Aaron Pinson in quotes, Pinson comma Aaron in quotes, Pinson family in quotes, or just Pinson and see what we come up with in these different search uh, websites. Well, first of all, Archive Grid is a good one. It, it's a subset of information from uh, Online Computer Library Center and the WorldCat database that meet certain criteria. And I've got here warnings subject to change. Every time I went and search an archive grid, I can do the same search over and over again and get different results. Part of that is they add material all the time. So just because you didn't find something today doesn't mean in six months you go back and are not gonna find anything. So I've given you the link, it's in the handout as well. And so here's an example of the sort of thing you're gonna see online just from their main website. They have little push pins for member archives. These tend to be larger archives that are participating. So I'm just gonna go for one, University of Missouri, St. Louis, and you can get the contact information or search the collections. And I'm just gonna randomly pick one and here's the sort of thing you get from archive grid. Uh, I just did a search for the whole ball of wax and you can see there's 326 collections in the University of Missouri St. Louis archives. But here's one that's uh, Arthur Whitman 35 millimeter negative collection. So uh, just an example of the sort of detail you'll get because they have good finding aids typically. So let's try Aaron Penson. Here's the search page. And you go up to the top in the box next to the little magnifying glass where it says search. And again, you can use Boolean logic. You can either use and or use quotes, uh, or you can use or. And we talked about what that means in the uh, online genealogy online session. And so we're going to look for Aaron Pinson in quotes. And I get one hit, Stovall Family Collection in S University of Southern Mississippi Special Collection. And one of the Aaron Pinson actually is purported to have married an uh, Eliza Stovall. And that's probably why I'm getting this hit. I also don't know that anybody's ever confirmed that. So I don't know if I would necessarily trust this. If I ever get a chance, I may contact University of Southern Mississippi and see what it is. But here's their finding aid, at least part of it. And if I go down to folder 68, Lou Hickson is a well-known genealogist on the Pinsons. And so I probably actually have already accessed the information found here, but you never know till you look. The next one is the National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections. It's usually called NUCMA, and it is uh, okay, it's maintained by, uh, I believe, Library of Congress, but you go to there, yeah, it's Library of Congress, and again, 
it gives you a different subset of collections out there to search. So in this case, I didn't find anything with Aaron Pinson. So I'm just going to use Pinson. And there's a ton of stuff because the Pinsons were a prolific group. And so there's a lot out there. But in this case, there was a general Pinson. And uh, so there's a lot of information out there about him. Then you can also use WorldCat. And if any of you have used WorldCat before, you have probably used it to find books. That's usually what it's used for. But if you click on format, there is an option for archival material. And you probably didn't know that, but most of you just used it for books if you've used it. And so I'll look for Aaron Pinson in WorldCat. Again, the link in your handout. And I find a Pinson Ancestors book. And actually, uh, this looks really kind of promising. And so I click on it and I find out it's in the Brigham Young University, uh, Idaho, Special Collections and Archives. And I have to view that in person. So I add that to my list of things to look at if I'm ever at BYU. Um, Something like this, um, you might be able to find elsewhere and in a more accessible site. So then you'd go back and, and search the book part of World Cat and see what you can find. Then there's something called Digital Public Library of America, which is materials for manuscript collections that have been digitized. And so I, I'm gonna search just Pinson for this one. And there's 1131 results for just Pinson that have been digitized. Now, a lot of these are probably not terribly useful, but I did get an Aaron Pinson one pop up pretty quickly. Um, and it's a voter list. So it's a voter list, I believe from Madison County, Florida. And I can actually click on it and go to the site. And when I blow it up, I get Aaron Pinson. And the date on it was such that it's not my Aaron Pinson. It's a different one. Plus, it's Florida. And I know my guy never set foot in Florida. But I did find an Aaron Pinson. Now, just to give you an idea how this can really work, and I've had this happen several times because archivists are all great people. I have had such wonderful experience with archivists. And if you be nice and always offer to pay for copies and that sort of thing, you can get some amazing and fast results. I had, had, I had been stuck on documenting a, a link between my ancestor, Mary Ellen Gearhart, and Thomas S. Gearhart, her purported father. And so actually I found um, the link in Illinois. Um, this particular daughter, Caroline, had on her I think, third or fourth marriage, they had to list their parents in the, in the marriage book during that time period. And lo and behold, there was Father Thomas S. Gearhart. And at one point they were in uh, Warren County, Kentucky. And I didn't know that. I uh, had them in Cumberland County, and then almost a 10 year gap between a census and they pop up in Madison County, Missouri. And I thought, well, I guess they were in Cumberland County and they just didn't generate any records. Well, then I found this when I looked for Caroline S. Gearhart, knowing that she was another daughter, I got a hit in Warren County, Kentucky in a marriage record. And I thought, well, Darn, maybe her father was there too. So I did a search for Warren County, Kentucky, Thomas S. Gearhart. Bingo. I found a hit in an archival collection where Warren County had sent its court case packets to the archives in, uh, it's a university uh, uh, archives in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And I thought, great. So I got the, uh, I found the folder number and the date and six items. So that's six pages, it's pretty small. So I emailed the archivist in there, found the contact information online and I emailed and said, here's what I'm looking for. And 
they responded, thank you for your inquiry. Our copy fee is normally 10 cents per page, but since this is a small file, I'm attaching it with our compliments. I love this person. <laughs> it was free and I had it by the end of the day. So, uh, and it was, he was sued for debt, but it documents that he was there in 1842 when, and it pushes it forward. And I can now look in Warren County for more records to see how long they stayed there before they came to Missouri. I'm going to ask you, you've, you noticed in the first slide that I've already donated uh, a, a collection and actually more than one collection. You saw the Acre uh, genealogical papers, but I want you to think about donating your materials to a manuscript collection. Why is that? As a genealogist, one of the most frustrating things I run into is hearing about records that existed at one time that somebody had. That person has been deceased for many years. I have no idea where the material is today. If you put it in a manuscript collection, it's going to help other people out because they're going to be able to find it. And they're not going to have to just throw up their hands and say, well, too bad, guess it's destroyed. Uh, a lot of times when people pass on, their heirs look at things and say, oh, this is just a bunch of old junk, throw it in. And for some reason, heirs like to burn documents. I don't know why, but they do uh, do that. And so neat things get burned. Neat things go in the dumpster, in the trash heap. So consider donating. Obviously, if you've got a nephew or a niece or a daughter or son that's really interested, you should pass your materials on to them. My son's really interested, but he doesn't want a whole pile of stuff that I've got uh, for him to store. And so I'm going to just donate it and make it in a form that he can access it when he needs it. So part of what I'm doing is scanning and putting it in the cloud and giving him the password. Part of it is going to be putting it in a manuscript collection. So uh, where do you give? Where do you donate it? And I'm not saying donate it with a gun to your head. I'm saying consider it. So part of it is what do you want from a donation? I've had people say, well, I want it to go in a display case in a museum where people can look at it. And sometimes that's pretty neat. But if it's an old ledger, most people look at an old ledger in a display case and think, whatever, what's that? Where it's really the information in the ledger that's really interesting. It's not the fact that it's an old ledger. So if that's what you want to have it on display, donate it somewhere that's going to put it on display or at least put it on rotating display. If you want to make it available to people, donate where, where there's a manuscript a bunch of manuscript collections that are accessible, preferably an institution that participates in archive grid, which will give you the maximum accessibility. So that goes to where do you donate? I always say donate where the, the organization participates in archive grid, but if not, donate somewhere where it's going to last. There are many local historical societies that have all the people that were really gung-ho about the society eventually either get old and can't do it anymore or they become deceased. And then where does the stuff go? Well, sometimes it disappears. It gets thrown away. People finger it, think, well, I can get money out of this. Always ask if you're going to donate somewhere, what is this organization's strategy if the organization folds? Where does the material go? And I refer to that as an exit strategy. How accessible do you want the material to be? As I mentioned before, many small local societies, it may be you want it in that small local society so that it's near where it was uh, generated originally. But keep in mind, many of those small societies can only be open one or two days a week. And so that cuts down on accessibility. And what do you donate? Well, 
An archivist can help you decide that, but generally, if it's material that uh, isn't duplicated elsewhere, that's original material that uh, is uh, gonna add substantially to the material that's out there available for research. What you've got here is we, uh, my brother-in-law donated his uh, uncle's papers. His uncle was killed in World War II in New Guinea and wrote a number of letters. And our graduate assistant was, one of her class assignments was to put together a display. And she asked if she could use some of the letters out of that collection for a world, a war letters display. And so he uh, borrowed these, duplicated them, and that's what you see in the display case are duplicates. And that was part of her war letters uh, display. So that's what you're seeing here. They're not normally on display, but in this case, we made copies available for display. What about genealogical collections? Well, this is uh, Betty Sewell who donated much of her genealogy to the State Historical Society. But for the most part, original documents that are in your materials, uh, anything you write up as a result of your research, some things like your notes, your family group sheets, your secondary materials, you, your Xerox copies of things out of libraries, really we don't want because those duplicate what's already available elsewhere. So uh, what I always do with a genealogical collection, if I'm advising someone to donate, I'll just say, check the part on the form that says, return materials that you don't want to the donor. So they won't be thrown away. You can ask that they be thrown away, but they're only gonna take a subset of your genealogy collection for the most part. Uh, otherwise, it's almost unwieldy unless you've really been good about keeping it indexed. You will be asked to fill out a deed of gift, which is a formal legally binding agreement between the donor and the repository. So you're transferring ownership and legal rights or some legal rights, it's your choice, to the materials. So this will include the name of the donor and recipient, the title of the materials and the description, transfer of ownership, how the collection can be accessed and what can be accessed by researchers, transfer of intellectual property rights or retention of some. Some people retain certain things like copyright until the decease of the donor. Uh, there's all sorts of possibilities. Separations, that is, what do you want done with unwanted materials? And there may be other elements. And finally, I'm going to leave you, when, when it comes to manuscript collections, a quote from Winston Churchill is really pertinent. Never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never get in, give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. And in the case of genealogists, I'd say sometimes good sense really goes the extra mile. Thank you again, everyone, everyone who joined us, and thank you, Bill. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, viewers.